Hello and welcome to another episode of Brave UX. I'm Brendan Jarvis, Managing Founder of The Space In Between, the behaviour-based UX research partner for enterprise leaders who need an independent perspective to align hearts and minds, and also the home of New Zealand's first and only world-class human-centred research and innovation lab. If that sounds interesting, you can find out more about what we do at thespaceinbetween.co.nz. Here on Brave UX, though, it's my job to help you to keep on top of the latest thinking and important issues affecting the fields of UX research, product management, and design. I do that by unpacking the stories, learnings, and expert advice of a diverse range of world-class leaders in those fields. My guest today is John Fukuda. John is the co-founder and chief experience officer of Limina, a professional design services firm that specializes in design operations, and that's on a mission to unleash human potential at the nexus of information, technology, and people. At Limina, John focuses on leading the company's human-centered design practice, including aspects of design such as design strategy, design systems, and interaction design. John's contributions to furthering the practice of design ops and its community saw him recently take on the role of curator of Rosenfeld Media's 2022 Design Ops Summit, the premier annual conference for the discipline. He is also the local chapter lead for the Denver Boulder area of Design Ops Assembly. John's prior career experience includes time as the Director of User Experience at Add This, where he was responsible for the website and product experience of what was then one of the world's most popular social sharing tools. He has also been a senior user experience consultant at Nervewire and a UX consultant and visual designer at Cambridge Technology Partners. John has generously shared his insights on stages provided by organisations like Nova UX, Rosenfeld Media, Friends of Figma and 24 Minutes of UX. And he has also recently launched Limina's very own podcast, The Limina Podcast, where he has conversations with a range of guests about human-centred digital transformation. And now he's here with me for this conversation on Brave UX. John, hello, and a very warm welcome to the show. Thank you so much. That was a, I, that's the best intro I've ever gotten. <laughs> <laughs> hey, it's all you, John. It's all you. John, one of the things, as you know, I like to do my research, and one of the things that I really found interesting about your life when I was doing that for this conversation is that I learned that you grew up in Japan and you were schooled at the Tokyo American School in Japan. And I felt like there was a story here and I was curious, how did this come to be? Yeah, um, so I'm, I'm mixed. My father's Japanese national, my mother's from the United States and they met here in the US. He was studying uh, for business and learning English. They met, married, and started to have children in Japan. So mm -hmm. I have three siblings who were born there. And then they moved to New York and had three more. And I'm the last. Uh, I was born in New oh, York, the baby. New Jersey. Mm -hmm. mm. Uh, when I was one, he got an assignment in Japan and we moved there. And so my five siblings and I, we all went to the American school in Japan. It was their, their decision was that I could still get the the culture of being you know living in in Japan but pay homage to my american heritage by staying with the expatriate community over there and um learning as an american would in a foreign foreign country so he figured i think it was my dad and my mom's decision that i'd get the best of both worlds that way and that school the american school of japan it's quite an old school it's got quite a history i think it dates back to somewhere around the, the turn of the 20th century yeah I was actually just back there uh, last month for a reunion. About 15 of us from my graduating class showed up there and they did some renovations. But one of the things they kept were all the stones from the graduating classes. And the stones go all the way back to the, you know, some of the earliest classes. They're just inscriptions, uh, carvings into the stone of the date of the graduating class. And yeah, there's a lot of history there. Whenever missionaries were coming over to build community in Japan, uh, that sort of was the, the impetus of the school. And it was always uh, mixed uh, Japanese students and American students sort of trying to build that bridge of the two cultures. And when you finished school in Japan, how, how long was it before you made your way back to the States? It was immediate. Uh, like I graduated in, in 90, 
two. And I was, you know, that fall I was in the U.S. Um, and I, I went to Rhode Island School of Design. And so it was here in, on the East Coast in New England. And I uh, spent four years there. I did go back to Japan to see if, you know, maybe there was a fit for a life for me over there. But I think too much of the English speaking culture and, you know, Japanese, I think was really kind of a second, uh, second language to me, even though I, I grew up in the country, I was English first and, uh, it's language and culture that build barriers between your capacity to be a professional in Japan, you know, and not, and I think the U S is a lot more forgiving that way. You kind of make your own relationships and build your own way. So mm. yeah, I think just, it felt, felt more natural to be here. Mm, that's interesting. Yeah, really interesting. I have heard that Japan is is very is very has a very rich and obviously a very old culture, and that it's not particularly open. Uh, hasn't been particularly open to change, and I know that's been changing recently. Or I believe I've read that it's been changing recently with the decline in population. Uh, so perhaps it may become more welcoming professionally for people. Yeah, I think what it is, and being in the profession that we are, uh, this this might makes sense, but there are cultures that are high context and cultures that are low context. So for instance, here in the US, people don't make ready assumptions of what they're seeing and 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 the exchanges they're having. They take everything sort of at face value for whatever it is that's going on. But in Japan, mm -hmm. uh, they can it's more high context. You should know, you know, by whom you're speaking with and the context you're in, the things that are appropriate to say and inappropriate to say. And, and it plays a huge role in the you know relationship dynamics. Unfortunately, as a professional, you take too many missteps in that in that arena and you um, you can insult the wrong people and, and that's the end of your game. So that's sort of the level of uh, pins and needles I didn't really want to live my life on, um, mm, having to be that contextually aware all the time. Yeah. That's a, that's a really interesting and unique, well, maybe not unique, but quite an, uh, an academic and, and quite accurate, I imagine, framing of that. You know, more generally speaking now, people in the West, in particular in America, there's a stereotype of a, maybe a bit of brashness, a little of a resistance to uh, status. You know, there's the, there's the focus on individualism. And, uh, and I imagine that some of those things rub up a very hierarchical and I think you called it a high context culture would mm -hmm. rub them up the wrong way, but but perhaps not intentionally, right? It's just a yeah. different way of being in the world. That's right. You mentioned uh, RISD, which is a pretty prestigious design school. Mm -hmm. And while it's not uncommon for people that I've spoken to on this podcast to come to design through design and art schools, what I thought was unique and interesting about your background is that you've studied sculpture you majored in sculpture. So how was it? How was the shift from doing something that's incredibly tactile and tangible? How was that shift for you moving into something that's really ephemeral and temporary, like the digital world that we inhabit as designers? Hmm. Uh, I used to think when you're in the arts and you're, you know, you're faced with either a blank canvas or a lump of clay, your mission is to form it into something that others can build a relationship to and have their own relationship to. And even if it's three-dimensional and even if it's quite representational and, you know, it is what it is, people can still have their own perceptions of it and, and build their own sort of dynamics with it. When I was in school at RISD, uh, it was really just like the internet was firing up, right? So we had gone, we had moved from just like using the web as academic communities to um, have dialogue with each other to commerce starting to come online, uh, email, you know, it was my freshman year as my first email account. Um, and really every, anybody's right. The, the, there was 1992, not a, not a, not everybody in the world had one yet. A special time, right? A very exciting right. time. It, it definitely was. And I wasn't shy of it. I, I had done some basic programming back in high school. And so I was looking at HTML. I was like, wow, this is not that complex. <laughs> Build some tables, throw some graphics in. And so I was having fun with that at school in parallel. And, you know, the same method of having a concept, uh, shaping that concept into something and putting it out in the world, it was just so much easier digitally than it was, you know, all the process intensity around building a sculpture of some kind. So I saw my affinity for it growing in parallel. 
but I knew when I got to my uh, graduation that I had not really built a vision for myself as a gallery artist. I just, I just knew that that's not where I was going to go. My passion wasn't there. And there was, a, there was a certain theater about the gallery life of an artist and the relationships you have to cultivate and sort of build a, a mythology of yourself as an artist. Uh, I just wasn't ready for that. But I was really intrigued with what was happening in the digital space. And it just so happened everybody was. And if you had the skills, uh, any, everyone was hiring, right? So eventually, I, it was a few years after graduating, you know, doing a couple of odd jobs here and there, but then I found my way to Cambridge Technology Partners. I, I spoke a few weeks ago with uh, Jeff Gothalf, and he has a joke that mm. around the same time when he was leaving college that if you could spell HTML, you could get hired <laughs> in the industry. And I suspect he's not, he's not wrong there. That's pretty close. Mm. Yep. Mm. But you, you've still maintained your, your art practice, and I know that these days you're painting as well as sculpting. Now, mm -hmm. what is it that you feel that this practice, this art practice gives you that your design practice perhaps does not? One thing is that it's just for me. Um, mm -hmm. a, a lot of the things I put into my professional life involve, you know, the strategy, the, the, you know, where does it fit in the business context? How does it match to the map to the user's needs? How does, you know, all the parts that go into the production, all of it in art, it's just a, a meditative space. I, I would say that I get to delve into something that's just uniquely interesting to me. Um, it sucks me in completely and I lose myself. And there's not a lot of places in the world that I, that, that I can take that space and hold it. And so for me these days, when I decide to take on another painting, that's, that's where I want to be. Mm. When you say take on, I, I believe your work is, you're available on commission. I do that. I've offered uh, and friends and family take me up, but I've had, I've had a couple of people who, you know, reached out to me for, for pieces. Um, and I've I followed through on that, but I found that, yeah, when I'm just doing it for a friend or a family member, the gravity of, you know, does, will this have the monetary value someone's looking for in a commission, all of that goes away and, and the freedom to just make something comes, comes up and, I think I prefer it that way. Like for me, I don't, I know that art has monetary value and it should for, for, for art, for those who have created a life for themselves as an artist, I want that for them. But for me and my journey with the arts, I, I just think that's, that's not where I'm not looking at it as currency and I don't, I don't want to tr treat it that way or it'll ruin it for me. So. I think you said something to the effect of you lose yourself in, in it when you're working on a piece. And it sounded to me like that, uh, that flow state that Absolutely. athletes and yeah right so you, you're able to actually just i suppose completely disconnect from the noise of the outside world when you're doing it absolutely mm. john i noticed on your website there's a japanese character on your art website the 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 logo type mm -hmm. if you like what what yep. tell me about that character what's that about that is um that's the character for luck and it's actually in japanese it's red fuku which is the first part of my last name. So Fukuda is my last name. And mm. um, the full name Fukuda is Lucky Harvest or Bountiful Harvest or something like that. But yeah, it's just, it's just a character. It's, I mean, if you go to any Chinese merchant, they usually have a placard of it in their shop. It's just meant to be good fortune. Mm. Well, hopefully it has brought you and continues to bring <laughs> you good fortune. Thank you. John, let's cha change gears a little and talk about something that it's actually was quite uh, close to me, not in any really deep and meaningful sense, but it was a platform, a product that I used a lot here at the space in between when we used to design and build websites. And you can probably see where this is going now. That is your time at Add This as Director of User mm -hmm. Experience. Just mm -hmm. for people who may not be familiar with Add This, what was the product and how did you come to work there? Okay. That product actually has a really cool history because as it started out, when the the initial pitch was made for venture, it was up against the ideas such as page flakes and the like. And I'm sure if you remember those, but they were widgets that you could compile onto a screen. 
that would have different things that like the news and the weather and along those things. And really what those were, but they were little wrappers for web, you know, portlets or applets or whatever you want to call it. Mm, that's what um, I haven't heard from a while. Applet. Yeah. yeah I remember. Uh, right. Mm. And so the founding members came up with a really cool idea that the web should be semantic and in being semantic, it should be semantically aware. So if you have those widgets and they're compiled onto a page and a news story comes up, well, let's say you have a news widget and you have a stocks widget at the same time, that your stock widget would change to reflect you know, the reporting of how that stock ticker is doing for that piece of news that just dropped. They just believed that there was this vision of the future of the web where those types of semantic relationships could play a role in, in how we consume information. Now, the investors were a little less interested in that, but more interested in how you could wrap content, especially with the advent of Facebook. And, you know, at that time, MySpace was still around and a couple of other um, social networks that you could wrap a piece of web content and get it into those social spaces. So the initial idea for, for the company that wasn't at that time yet add this, it was ClearSpring, was to take web parts or blobs and wrap them in a widget and be able to inject them into social media websites. Really big consumers at that time, NBC, NFL, they wanted their content into those social networks. So they were using the service to do that. And then, you know, your your average web content producer w wanted to also get their stuff all over the, the social web. So they were using the service. Uh, it just so happened that alongside of that, there were a number of other competitors, including Add This, that were taking a little less fussy approach to getting content onto social media. And they, they weren't wrapping or containing it. They were just sharing either a link or a, like a little blurb of it. And then the users would use that. They'd see it on social media, but then they'd end up at those destinations. And it was smarter. It was leaner. They ended up buying Add This. So that's how we merged and became Add This. My job was sort of taking these new concepts because I was still working with the old technology, the wrapper and the, the blob wrapper type thing, and trying to get onboard content creators into, you know, what's the workflow for wrapping my stuff and injecting it into? And then what are the analytics from that? What can I learn on social engagement with the content that's everywhere? Um, so we were building interfaces for that kind of stuff. It got a, a little bit different when Ad This came online and actually I had a, there was a Bit of redundancy. So that's when I made my exit, but they were largely successful and Oracle, I think owned this one now. So that was a good exit for somebody there. <laughs> On that note, I, I uh -huh. got a, all nostal nostalgic and I checked out the Add This website and I found that unfortunately Cisco, who, as you mentioned now, owns Add This, is shutting it mm -hmm. down on yeah. May 31, which is complete end of an era. Yeah. I mean, you know, everything matures, right? So these things, which were they were novel services at the time are now just part of our everyday, everyday experience with the web. People can share whatever they want and it comes in exactly the form factor you want it, you know, because everyone's ready for it. But it took, it took, I think a little bit of that leadership, you know, the, the minds of those, those engineers and designers to, to push that into what's now the new normal. And yeah, I guess it's, it makes it so that we don't need a company to do that anymore. That's just part of the web experience. As one chapter ends, another begins. And I actually think that you founded Limina before you started at Add This. So there yep. was some crossover. You've been running Limina for nearly 20 years now mm -hmm. and running my own business for coming up 13. It isn't always easy, if ever. And you have to wear many hats and the buck always stops with you. What is it that keeps you going? What's kept you going for nearly 20 years? Well... When we started Limina, it was we, we were three independent contractors at the time. We were we each had our specialties. Um, Maria is still a partner at Limina. Jake Burkhart, who is one of the th the third founder, his specialty was in research. Uh, now mm. he's he's moved on and doing great things. Um, he's just signed a book with Rosenfeld, I believe. That's right. Yep. Yeah. And yep. Um, he talks a little bit about what's going to go in that book in in the podcast I did with him. So we each had our own special expertise that we brought to that tr 
you know, that trilogy of us. And I think the, the customers we were working with at the time, they were tired of three invoices every time, every month. So they asked us to just make things simpler and form a company. So as you can imagine, we started a business as senior practitioners in our field, and we, we didn't really come at it from the NBA business angle. So we didn't have business operations as our core expertise. A lot of those things that we've done to shore up and create the company that it is today has come through a school of hard knocks. And, you know, there, there were ups and downs and definitely some mistakes in how, you know, how you deal with the ebbs and flows in business. I think learning the ropes on, you know, what is lead generation and, and sales cycle and how do you maintain those, that cog while you're also in service delivery on a tw almost 24 seven, you know, how do you, how do you actually work those cogs so that they're, they're not stepping on each other's toes and, and ruining each other's lives, especially when you're small and young and agile, right? Yeah. And a lot of that just is, was a lot of hard learning. And I wish I had taken time to get an MBA and, and figure that all out, but I, I, I wouldn't trade in what I have today and the, the way that I came to it, uh, for an MBA, I think, I think we've been able to really build the culture we wanted at Limina without taking somebody else's sort of outside perspective on what a business like ours should be and really just grow it into, uh, what we have. And, and I'll just start all the way back at the beginning where we, when we said, okay, let's, let's make this a company. What, what would our mission be? And we said it was, it would be to enable and enhance and expand human potential. And we said it then really in those early days. And we've, we tried to say, Hey, let's have a rebrand. And what's our, what's our mission? Has it changed? It hasn't changed. I mean, we want to continue to unleash human potential. So that's what gets me out of bed. I mean, that's what excites me. I still feel like there's a lot to be done there. Technology is not out of the way in terms of making our lives easier all the time. Sometimes it's completely in the way and sometimes it's making a mess of our lives. I mean, even with social media, we might think we've made great leaps and bounds in communication, but I think we've really made a mess. And so the human work is really yet to be done. I mean, the real hard thinking and, you know, strategic implementation of technology in a way that's meaningful to us all, not just for commerce and for people to, you know, buy things easier, but what are the things that we're doing? What's the knowledge work we're all trying to do in our given vocations and how can we improve those things? How many more meetings do designers have to have with engineers before we fully understand each other? Or is there just a missing platform where we have a shared understanding and shared components and shared things that make us more better collaborators and better partners to each other. So I think back to your question, like what keeps me going and why what's driving me is that I don't feel like we're done yet. I feel like the mission hasn't been served, that there's so much history behind us and great thinking in the world of user experience work and not just what we've created and in, in, as a practice, but what has yet to be created as a practice. And that's what excites me. Yeah, the future potential. And what is it about the area of focus design ops that you've turned your attention to? And I'm not sure how recently, but what is it about this particular area of design practice that you feel is worth dedicating so much energy and effort to? Yeah, we had been thinking broader. So I'll just back up to before I went to the 2019 Design Ops Summit. On the run up to that, my team had been thinking about what are the missing pieces in design that are making things more challenging for us? So as a consultant and a, you know, someone who runs at, at design problems from an agency perspective, every time we're coming into a new project or a new customer, we're having to explain some of the, the, the basics, like what are the merits of user research or usability testing? Why would you do workflows and wireframing uh, before visual mockups and just like some of the things that if we look to look at each other and we talk to each other, they just seem like basics. There's a reason why we still have to have those conversations. And what we came to was that there was no, there was no standards practice. So if you look at, you know, engineering and ISO standards, there's something that baselines a level of this is good. This is not best practice. When you talk to designers, we have this sense about us that what we're doing is craft and, and it's fine. Like I, I don't begrudge any designer for like 
wanting to dig deep into, you know, the craft a- aspect and the graphic design angle they want to push into the work that they do. It's great, but there are still needs to be standards around, you know, what's usable, what's, what's challenging for users, you know, just basic usability heuristics, right? For whatever reason, there's no standards body for design. So it just like UPA was there, then it became the UXPA. But even then, even with a HF, HFI has like a, a CU, you can become a, you know, CUA or something like that, some kind of, that you get a certificate or whatever, but that's still not baking standards into our community of practice. My lean into design operations is that I felt like it might be our one chance to stand, like if you look at a business very simplistically, like those business operations, dev operations and design operations, there'd be three pillars, three legs to stand on. And if you had a de- design ops manager, they would be the one to organize and orchestrate design's position in an organization. I didn't really know that yet. And those were just ideas we were playing with and trying to come up with a way to frame and, and build the message around that when I heard of the Design Ops Summit. And by the time I had heard of it, it was already the fifth the fifth year of it. And that was 2019. We were still pre-COVID. So I, I went to Brooklyn and I sat in the audience and I had goosebumps and all the things. I, I think I had permagrin on my face at every uh, speaker's presentation. And I just knew at that point, like basically that I had found my tribe, that these were the people that were speaking the language, the the gap that I felt was happening in our market between, you know, design delivery and business innovation. Just where, where was that gap being filled? And, and this was it. And it's been that way for me uh, since 2019, I, I've really leaned in. Uh, that 2020, the design integration report I had started before attending the design ops summit. So we didn't call it design operations. We were, we were calling it design integration because we were, we were struggling to find the right language for it. But yeah, I, I believe that if design operations takes its rightful place in, in organizational leadership, that we might have a better chance at actually advancing the field in a way that's meaningful. And it's not just to serve designers and researchers to be better contributors, but to be really well integrated as a, as a business of the future. That's what, that's my hope. You recently wrote a blog post called Design Ops Zeitgeist 2023. And in there, you suggested that integrating design ops into the enterprise, there's been some significant progress made there. So thinking back to what you were describing there and the the 2019 Design Ops Summit sitting in the audience and finding that you found your people, you know, you were hearing stories of how these people were reimagining the design operations within their organizations. And forums like conferences are a really good symbol and signal that there are, there's a community forming around something like design ops. But you've also suggested that there is a big lie when it comes to enterprises' adoption of design ops. What is that big lie? The big lie, the big lie is that they actually understand design's value and, well, they value it themselves in a way that they are going to make it a part of their mission to, yeah, to integrate design in a way that drives business value. And I I call that out as a lie because like they will put out a job recommend request for, we need a design ops manager, or, you know, we're going to build design leadership and they may even give design a seat at the, at the leadership table. But then I think when the chips are down and we're seeing this today, those biggest cuts that are coming from the industry are amongst designers and uh, researchers. And I'm just seeing, you know, that and among you know, my peers and it's all the talk at the water cooler for all design ops managers is like, Hey, they're just shedding the talent pools. So I didn't see the evidence in the claim that like we value design and they can read the McKinsey design report and they can say, this is what we're going to do, but I'm just not seeing it. And it's hard to really have the argument because some organizations are going to say, well, look at everything we've done to, you know, to train our, our teams on design thinking and do all these things. And 
it's just not good enough. Like to really say we're going to take design as, as a practice, not just for serving our customers better, but also for thinking of new ways to actually engage our the, the marketplace, right? And how do we actually continuously disrupt ourselves out of our preconceived notions of what the market needs into new ways of thinking and modeling ourselves for new, you know, new business opportunities or new ways of, of serving and using technology. The evidence just isn't there yet in a way that's in, in a way that you we can all look collectively at, at, or at businesses today and say, Hey, they're really getting design. You can say that for the, for the ones that we always talk about, right. For, for, you know, Airbnb or Apple or Google, the, the ones that take design seriously, but they're three out of a sea of millions of businesses. I guess what I'm hearing is that actions tend to speak louder than words, right? And you Absolutely. and I, and probably the majority of people that are listening to this conversation, we have a a vested and subjective self-interest in the preservation of design and making sure that the value of design is clear. You know, we we are the people that are, losing jobs here, losing livelihoods and facing the hard challenge of finding a new job in mm -hmm. a tough economy. Maybe not you and me specifically being self-employed, but needless to say, that does affect our businesses as well. Mm -hmm. Now, I've heard you say, and I'll quote you now, if organisations truly understood and valued human-centred research and design, not only would researchers and designers be the last ones laid off during tough economic headwinds, but org leaders would consider how to better support their efficiency of delivery at scale. So there you're talking about investment in design ops. Mm -hmm. Is it that the company leadership, the people that are making the decisions to restructure their organisations and lay people off, and you've raised the point that it may be negatively impacting designers more than the rest. Is it that they don't value human-centered design or is it that they just place a higher value on other things? I, I wish I knew. The reason I make that argument is because I, I want somebody to challenge me. <laughs> I, I want somebody to come out from the industry and say, actually, this is the reason. But I would say that when I, when I wrote that, there, was, you know, there, there were a lot of layoffs happening right at that time. And a lot of green badges on LinkedIn, right? Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, I was seeing that and I was hearing from other design ops managers that now I'm getting told to do more with less. And so they're telling me to scale design. They're telling me, you know, I have to achieve more and get more value out of these more limited resources. It's not the goal of design operations that you have so much efficiency that you can let designers go. It's actually, you're freeing up their capacity to do all the things. So if you look at design as two, two halves of the same brain, one half of the brain has to be focused on, you know, what, what aren't we doing? What are the innovation opportunities ahead of us? And then the second half of the brain is, well, let's continue to maintain and deliver with excellence against the things that people are using of ours right now the things that are in the hands of users right this moment. Let's make sure that continues to be excellent while we look to the future of what are the things that aren't do we aren't doing, what are the things our competitors are beating us on, or what are the unmet needs of users that are out there that we still need to serve? And you, if you start cutting designers and telling design ops managers to do more with less, you're asking the same designer to sit there and, and innovate the world of the future while they're still clearing the backlog of all the products that they have on hand. And it's, that's a terrible, like no designer wants that, that life, no matter how much of a unicorn they are, it's not scalable and it'll break, it'll break us as humans. Yeah, I think you're right. I spoke with uh, Sacham Kantamneni last week who runs UX Reactor and he has an interesting perspective on this. He was once asked a question by a researcher uh, why they were having difficulty getting the business across the line with a proposal to basically put in place some operations that would save some money, as it was 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 just not landing with the executives. And Sachem framed it up as understanding what the core driver for the business was, whether it was cost efficiency or whether it was the pursuit of new revenues. And hearing you talk about uh, that a little earlier when you were speaking about 
Apple and Airbnb. You know, those companies strike me as businesses that fall more into the pursuit of new revenues, of new opportunities, of you know, reinventing markets. Um, and I suspect, sadly so, that uh, many businesses are led by people who are perhaps more conservatively minded, and that drives this focus, this heavy focus on cost out, cost reduction, and efficiency, mm-hmm. which which rubs up quite poorly against how we as designers tend to see and articulate the value that we bring. I think you're right there. And I also think that when I say we have more work to do, I I mean that across the entire design community, not just design ops managers or design leaders. I feel like every designer's job should not only to be solving problems or making products better, but to be able to articulate why. So if you have a hard time tying the great things that you do as a designer to the outcomes you might be giving that are downstream from your great designs and to business revenues, if you have a hard time articulating those things, see that as a challenge and and something that you should take on and try to draw those connections to. Because the more you can connect yourself and the craft that you have and the talent that you bring to every day to those uh, positive business outcomes and customer you know, satisfaction outcomes, whatever they are, those things that make businesses successful. That's helping the whole community really do our job better and actually positions the idea of what a designer could do for a business when the time comes where they're faced with economic hardship. Well, maybe I'll throw my chips down on, on the design team. Maybe they'll Maybe they can find a new market or break into new markets. It's a failing on our part to help define ourselves as as those that are bringing new markets and new disruptions to new ways of, of leveraging technology, right? Uh, I just feel like we haven't entered that conversation at the right level yet. I just want to put in a, a little plug here, and there's no financial relationship between me and uh, Ryan Rubsey of Second Wave Dive, but you were talking about our need to better connect the dots between our activities and the value, the business value it creates. Now, Ryan runs uh, Chief Design Officer School, and I've been hearing some really good things about that. And his whole mission is to help elevate the business nows that uh, we may lack, more generally speaking now, as designers so that we can more effectively articulate what that value is and, and I suppose, strengthen our design organisations, not just from the perspective of uh, avoiding future layoff decisions because people mm-hmm. are clearer about our value, but also mm-hmm. just round out our understanding of the context, the business context that we're operating in. Uh, John, I want to come to something that you observed or you've made a really interesting observation in, and that is that while IT departments in enterprise have been really studious in optimizing business operations for efficiency through technology, they've largely taken a hands-off approach when it comes to supporting the design organization to implement the same sorts of systems or, or similar sorts of systems that would enable design operations to achieve efficiency at scale. What is it that you suspect is behind this disconnect or this apparent disconnect here? I think it, I think it might be a language barrier. So, people, so some designers who have sort of been leaning this way have talked about object-oriented UX or OOUX, that there may be a set of taxonomies that would lend themselves well to building better systems for design integration through to component libraries and 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 more. If we look or lean into that a little bit more, that could go further upstream even to how researchers ad, researchers are atomizing their their work and their findings and their insights. If we started to build more common language around these are the use cases, these are the the tasks within that use case. These are the components that we've designed to support that use case or the workflows. Um, all of that could be tied together through you know, some kind of a system that is unified and has traceability. We just don't have that, right? Because we haven't taken the time. I think IT to support engineers and, and engineers themselves have looked at really critically at here's my code base. Here's here's what a repository can do for me. Here's what a put get could do. and And can even look for specific snips of codes and you know do the quick swap out 
designers and, and researchers don't have that kind of engineering behind the tools that we're using. Figma is getting really good at getting us to collaborate as designers with each other and even bringing the prototyping aspects and design commentary, the feedback and the comments. That's all coming together, but still there, unless it's um, contextually in line, the comment and placed on the right component, it could be completely disconnected. So if they just misplaced where that comment was, you wouldn't know who it was for. And it's not exportable, right? That doesn't, that won't live anywhere outside of Figma unless you build a plugin to generate a ticket for that, for instance, that targets the right designer or, you know, researcher to conduct some studies around how that component could be better designed. So the point being, because the framework isn't there for researchers, designers, and engineers to really fully have workflow or like a workbench that supports this person's work as it feeds into this person's. We can't really have tri-track continuous integration, continuous design. We can talk about it, but what it means is a lot of rituals, a lot of meetings, and a lot of us having the human work to manually enforce, you know, what's coming up in the tri-track. For people that aren't aware of tri-track, mm -hmm. what's, uh, what's the TLDR of what you're talking it's, about there? Uh, so tri-track is a method that you can use to upstream of engineering or de a deployed sprint, you can have a little discovery work. And then slightly downstream of that, but still upstream from engineering, you can have some design cycles. And then you have your engineering cycles. And they're, they're staggered in a way that you can not have to bottleneck each other so that the research is continuously feeding into the design planning and cycling. And, and then the design cycles are continuously feeding into your engineering and so you're it's not, getting you're there. We're to, getting there. Hmm? You're not trying to jam everything into a two week sprint cycle. Correct. Yeah. You've staggered out and you've given yourselves an optimal value at, at those different touch points. And we're, we're getting, I, th I feel like the momentum will take us there. I think people will discover that they want and need more and we will build and create more, but call me impatient, I guess, because I, I, I think we have, just a lot more work to do. And one of the things that I do think gets in the way is that uh, there's re just resistance with it. I think researchers are getting better. I think when they talk about their insight repositories and the way they're building them to atomize their studies and, and build them up into great insights, for whatever reason, yes, we have design systems, but we're not really reaching out to say, well, how can we better integrate insights into our design system workflow or how can we run, you know, tests and use the test to build governance into what's going in and coming out of the design system. And then I think there's better work that is actually happening with Storybook uh, to integrate into the component UI component libraries in the code base. So we're getting there incrementally, but I'm still not seeing anyone say, hey, let's take this on as an industry and let's really harness this. And maybe it's because it needs a key player. It needs a someone like Figma to say, "Okay, we're not we're not only going to give space to designers. Let's let's branch out now and let's make this bigger." Or, you know, could it have been Atlassian or whomever? It just needed so someone somebody needs to swim upstream or or downstream. That's and, right. and connect the dots for people. That's right. Or they just need to sit down and have a good conversation with each other and and talk about the future. I know that someone that we both know, Lou Rosenfeld, would probably agree with what I'm about to say is what what it sounds like to me that you're saying is that we are still very much, even within design and research, siloed in the scope of our products and that those products aren't even really talking that well to each other, let alone a downstream to engineering. And that, and why I say this, Lou would agree with this is because as you know, the Rosenfeld Media logo of the elephant is all about the blind people and the elephant and everyone is touching the elephant and trying to describe what they are feeling, but no one's talking to each other about what that whole picture looks like. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah. I've wondered how do we get them in the room? Whoever cares about this topic and whoever's got resources to do something about it, how do we get them in the room? And I mean, I'm. it's an open invitation because I'd love to talk about this with whoever runs those products. Yeah, I just feel like us as a community of designers and design leaders, we need to lean into that more and we need to ask and demand more, whether it's, you know, submitting tickets 
or making feature requests or whatever it is, uh, we need to identify what those gaps are and we need to be loud about it. John, you mentioned before we started recording about the Limina podcast, and I touched on that in your introduction. And I've heard you say, and I'll quote you now, and this will all make sense in a second, I promise. I've heard you say at this point, and you were ref- reflecting on the poor economic circumstances in terms of the layoffs on design and, and, uh, and research, you said at this point, the conversation should be aimed at business managers charged with digital transformation initiatives. And why uh, I'm trying to connect this to your podcast here very quickly mm-hmm is I believe the scope of the Limina podcast is actually to broaden the conversation about design ops outside of the design community and yeah. engage with people that are in different areas of expertise. Yeah, I, I think there's a real great function to community that you can you can organize and be self-organizing, right? And, and everybody sort of come to some agreements on what things are and what they aren't. But the negative sort of unintended consequence of that is communities do at some point build a walled garden for themselves and they're not doing a good enough outbound communication. So it's almost like the design ops community needs a marketing leader to say, Hey, these are the key messages. This is the, this is the intention and the objective. These are the the relationships we need to make and who we need to make them with. And these are the conversations we should be having. And yeah, I, I think it's our job to, find the right audience and to have some of those harder conversations. And even if it's a conversation that puts design operations in its, in, in its place, it says, Hey, you guys are trying to do like too much here. This is maybe try focusing on this. Even if it's that, like it's better than what we have today, which is everyone in design operations thinking that it should be something more than, than it is and not having traction and not knowing why, or ha- having small success stories or failures, and then having to reconcile all those things and say, well, it's just different at my organization. Because at a certain point, it shouldn't be. At a certain point, if we're going to talk about advancing the future of business in general, right? So how do we how do we best utilize the technologies that are coming at us to build business opportunities? And how do we use design as a method for building products and services to best, you know, implement those technologies. If we if we really want to have that conversation, then it it can't just be held by designers. It has to be you know, technologists, business business leaders and and design leaders I think need to be cyclically looking at that problem and coming up with collective ways to to fold each other into a collective understanding. So John, can we expect on the Limited podcast soon a conversation between yourself, the CPO at Figma and the CPO at Atlassian? <laughs> I, I, I will make an attempt. I'll say that. <laughs> I'm, I'll send out invitations. So you were talking earlier on about how you came up with the 2020 Design Integration Report and titled it as such because it was beginning to be written before you'd actually discovered, I suppose, or found your people in the design ops community. In the report, there are a number of really interesting things in the report, and I just want to call one of those out now. And I realize it's from three years ago, so you might have some more current data here. But you you were talking about the majority of companies, they hadn't actually fully realized the potential of design ops. And about this, you said, for most of us, roughly 80% of businesses, there are far lower levels of maturity, not because of the intention of design ops managers, but because of the cultural readiness for their organizations to embrace the value that design integration can deliver. Mm-hmm. So when you say cultural readiness, what do you mean? What are you touching on there? Oh, I've, I've, I mean, that's what I think we've been discussing just over the past few minutes here is just that and it's got two parts of it and the design community has to own their ground here, but it's, it's getting the message clear. So it's, it's, it's one thing for McKinsey to come out with a report and even, you know, prior to them for there to be the design index or whatever that was, that was showing that S and P on the S and P, they were outperforming companies by 200 X or something like that. That's one thing. But then for actual designers on the ground, like with the boots in the ground, people within the organizations to deliver on that promise, right? If that's the expectation that a business leader has because they've read the McKinsey report or they've seen those reports and 
they don't have the right acumen to marshal their their design talent into becoming that. We're not seeing there's a mismatch, right? So deliver the designers themselves may not be delivering on the promise. So that's one part. And then business owners or business managers aren't taking the time to learn a little bit more about well, what is the disconnect and why can't we harness that power that they claim they have? It's just the best way I could phrase that is that it's a, it's a level of maturity, right? Our relationship hasn't hit that point yet. So I think that's why I champion design operations so much is that it can sit at the level of, well, let's look at what's operationally inefficient or the things that are that are not representative of operational excellence when it comes to the value that design can deliver. And let's get those things going right. And then let's champion the innovation cycles that that designers are earned once they're not doing all the other things like administrating which tools their team's using and all those other parts that come with having to be a designer without a design ops manager. Now the and, devil's in the um, detail, right? The yeah, devil's in the detail sure. here. But it sounds to me like that shouldn't be an impossible task. Like this should be very much tapping into, you use the term zeitgeist in your late, latest blog post, but the business zeitgeist around mm -hmm. Uh, the language, the the sort of the 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 binary language, if you like, of of business, the zeros and ones of dollar in, dollar out. Like this shouldn't be impossible for us to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you mentioned Jeff Gothelf. I mean, his book Sense and Res Respond is a, a real, like, great business book. And I don't know who in the business community looks at that book and says that's a great business book. It's an it's an amazing business book. It's it's huge in the design community. I mean, we all look at it because it's got new models for continuous design, continuous integration for us. But I think a business manager or a business owner needs to look at that book and say, what are the opportunities that lie in reshaping the way I, I, I build my business in this new model? And that's the kind of, I think, two-way street, you know, maturity of our relationship that I don't think is there yet, that we're not trying to speak each other's language enough to connect at that level. So, and, and this might be like one of those, those conversations you see on Twitter, like designers need to learn to code or, you know, I, I don't know if you've seen that it's, it's kind of a cliche and a joke, but I, I do think to your point about the, the chief design, uh, the school you were just talking to about the business end of design, it's true. We do have an impact on business and how business can or can succeed through outcomes that we bring through, you know, better design and, so we need to understand that language and where we, we're connecting with those threads. And so the, the responsibility is a little bit on us. But at the same time, as we're making those impacts, business leaders should be looking at that and really be, being given the, the design community their due at successes that they're having and driving better traction with, with their customers, right? So it's a two-way street. And I, I don't expect a, design, a business leader to be a design leader. I don't, I don't think anybody wants that, but the recognition of where, where they need to collaborate and where they can serve each other best, that has to, that has to be a discussion that they want to have, right? I just don't think it's there yet. Speaking about two-way streets, now I might be in danger here of flogging a dead horse, so feel free to pull me up on this if you feel that I am, but you spoke earlier on about championing design or design operations. And I'll quote you now again from the report. You said, implementing a design communication plan that teaches the company about the benefits of working with design, design's role in building products with a superior user experience, and how design can work collaboratively with the business and technology. So this to me sounds like championing, it sounds like evangelizing, it sounds like you know the sort of rattling of the design saber. And stepping back from this, and I've asked this question before of other guests, and I think I'm asking it again today because I feel like I've never really had a satisfactory answer to it. And my question is, what is it about us and design that we feel the need to do this kind of outward evangelizing of the value that we believe that we bring? You know, it seems to me that other fields, you know, product and engineering, specifically in this context, they don't feel that same need or they don't demonstrate that they feel that same need to try and justify the value that they bring. It's almost as if it's assumed by their very nature of being there that they represent value. So what is it, what is it about us that we feel like we have to do this? 
I wish that's another question you've asked that I wish I knew. Some things have worked really hard against us. A lot of it's might, might be our own fault. So I'll, I'll just start by saying like when I got into user experience work, this is like 1998, one of my mentors used to bring up, you know, some of the old great, like the work had already started to get done. Xerox had like a, I don't know how many page usability heuristics check checklist out there. And so human factors work in human computer interaction had, has been done, uh, ha had been done at that point. And that's the school we were coming from looking at applied research and how design impacts the usability and that those things were quantifiable and had, you know, had impact. And that, you know, ultimately in a consumer context that would impact, you know, how many consumers you have. And that's a revenue conversation, right? Those were simpler days. I feel like what happened almost in parallel to that was you had the advertising world who was looking at, you know, magazines sort of being taken over by the internet and saying, okay, we need to understand digital. And they had a huge workforce of designers, right? And people and writers and people who really understood the psychology of design from a, from a buyer mindset. Like I want, I want this ad in front of people. <laughs> it's like um, Alan Trout, and, like the psychology yeah, of positioning, that sort of stuff. Correct. And yeah. so that massive talent pool of ad designers coming into digital adopted the word user experience or UX and started, we started mingling these two spaces, right? The H H C I sort of human factors workers who are already there in computing, you know, even in, in the early nineties and even maybe in the late eighties, we're running up against these new sort of digital designers from the ad world. I think we made a mess of things a little bit in talking about design. This is the the intent of design. And it was for consumers. No, it's for users and, you know, CX, UX. And so over the years, that that sort of churning conversation hasn't helped us much because we're unable to be crisp or, or clear on the real value or we're trying to bring. It's, a, it's, it's to sell things. No, it's to make the user experience better so that people's lives are easier so they continue to use our products. And so we challenge ourselves on being able to express clearly what, what the value is. And then I think we make it harder for others to hear and understand it. Yeah. It, I don't, I don't think it's an overt turf war whenever you see uh, conversations about user experience versus you know, customer experience. It's not like anyone's saying, Hey, you're co-opting or, but there is an undercurrent of we're confusing the people who we need to serve most. And sometimes that's the, the business owners who were, who were building products for and service designs for. So. One of the things that really annoys me is the level of binary framing and the attention that's paid to the binary framing of, you know, the us versus them, the UX versus CX, that it's either this or it's that. And I feel like we, we lack a, a will because potentially of a result of identity-based, you know, corporate career type politics that gets played out in echo chambers in various industries. But I feel like we are missing the the and in the conversation and that we probably need to reframe some of our views or be at least open to reframing some of our views about mm -hmm. what it is that we do and the value that we create and whether or not we can expand the scope uh, of how we how we frame that value so that we can actually get out of this spinning of our wheels it feels like that we're in you know yep. even you and I were talking offline right like the design community and this is a design podcast mainly aimed at designers let's be frank and researchers I'm putting in that category we mm -hmm. can get very insular and very internally focused and it can it can start to get a little bit uh, samey I suppose mm -hmm. over time now, do you do you have any insights or hopes or uh, glimmers uh, glimmers of things that you've seen out there that you feel are refreshing in terms of the way that the conversation could unfold and that we should potentially nudge it towards? I'd like to think, and it's you know going back to one of your first questions of what what drives you or what keeps you going. Anyone who's willing to challenge the status quo and and say, okay, yes you know, make some acknowledgements, right? So yes, we've achieved a lot and, but also be willing to say we're not done yet. And if there's a call to action, 
what what might that be and how can I contribute to it? I think, you know, you think about disruption just as a behavior pattern. To go out there and, you know, be provocative and give space to challenge and and come up with something new. It's part of our remit, I think, as as experienced designers, right? To to continuously question, are we actually doing this right? Could there be a better way? And it just serves us better to to behave that way because it builds pattern and it builds opportunity for something new. And I, I'm I'm always looking like Chat GDP. It scares the hell out of me. And AI and everything that it's doing. You know, even as as fearful as you might get as as someone who's a professional who's looking at you know how might this ruin my career, you also have to look at like how might it just completely explode new opportunities for you as as a professional, right? To to just look at everything that way and say, hey, there's there's likely a thousand opportunities here that we're just not thinking of, and to give your space that self space that di- uh, every day to say, okay, what's the one thing I'm going to look at that's new, or what's the one thing that I hate that I'm going to try and come up with a, a solution for? I, I'm inspired every day by by the people that you bring onto your podcast. You know, those people. They're not, they're not ready to quit. We're all, we're all sort of leaning into the, the problem space and saying, let's keep doing this. So yeah, that's if, if I'm trying to give someone an inspirational message, maybe keep digging. <laughs> yeah. Cause, cause there's just more, more to be done, more to be known. It's a, a really refreshing and positive perspective. And I think it's also quite deeply in tune with our value as designers and that mm-hmm. we are. You know, if if we embrace uh, if we embrace the better qualities of of our field, you know, curiosity is right there, or close, very close to the core, if not at the core of what it is that we do. Now, I want to just come up, before we bring the, the show down to a close, I just want to come back uh, to this conversation about the the value of design. And you had spoken earlier on about how uh, th- there were ISO standards and there was quantification, or at least some sort of attempt at objective measurement of uh, value or the usability of a system, that sort of thing. Now, in the report you said, and I'll quote you again now, demonstrating return on investment is foundational to illustrating the importance of design integration, especially to leadership. Now, that is a big challenge, and I think we've touched on that in the conversation so far. So getting, you know, getting to grips with the commercial outcomes of the activities that we perform is mm-hmm. undoubtedly a bit of a challenge. You've got a unique perspective on this, though, because your agency lives or dies, I would imagine, on its basis, on its ability uh, to be able to articulate value of the things yeah. that your clients are investing in. So I wanted mm-hmm. to ask you about this because of that unique perspective that you bring. You know, what is it that you what are the kind of conversations around value that you have with clients that perhaps enterprise internal design leaders can borrow from to better articulate inwardly and smooth mm-hmm. the road if you like that uh, sure. you know a company like yours might be having uh, with their other leadership peers you know what are the sorts of things the low hanging fruit that they can touch on or the words that they can drop that help people to understand what it is that you're doing sure so one of the more costly aspects of design is the time it takes the labor intensity around you know research strategy p- design planning design execution and also the salaries you pay to those those people who play those roles for you. So their time then is a commodity, it's a cost center. Uh, one of the things we try to do with our customers is really well articulate the, the, the cost of running a research program or running you know, a design sprint around a specific feature set. Uh, and we do that through working up from the ground up, so sort of ground up estimate on this is the the number of things we're going to try to achieve in this, you know, statement of work. Here's the hours and time that come into it, you know, times the rate of our hourly, you know, expenditure. And so in that way, they're sort of looking at the numerics and saying, okay, you know, you're talking about a time duration of X, a dollar value of X. And in line with that, as we're delivering, we're also giving them the tools and the templates and the techniques to do it themselves. We try to onboard them. They're sort of saddling alongside us as we deliver. And we're giving them the tools that they can do this and say, you know, these are the, these are the components you're going to be able to reuse, and this will save you time. And if you've 
if you've studied, you know, as we're delivering, you have a sense of what it's going to take from you effort wise. And so we do that in the research cycles. We do that in our strategy and you know, requirements prioritization cycles, as well as the design planning and execution cycles. And each part of that has its own framework, its own set of tools, templates. And we, we don't just execute and say, here's the thing we delivered, good luck. We give them all those things that we've generate, generated along the way, and we give them the tooling to do it themselves. So like an IP transfer of sorts. A little bit, yeah, because it's in line with our mission, right? That we want to not just deliver the design outcome, but we want to actually improve the excellence that within which you know research and design is happening. And we want to enrich that environment at our customers as well. So when they look at a research initiative that's coming up, they have a framework or a way to think about it, you know, both on the cost side, but then they'll have seen potentially what the yield was downstream of that. And then they can say, well, yeah, the outcome will it will justify the expense. And that's the best way you can you can sort of build that common understanding of the value of design is by not just explaining it and you know, writing it up in a study or, or giving them a report, but actually showing them firsthand and, and bringing them through the journey. And then they can, you know, any feedback we're getting along the way is only going to make it a more improved process for us. We, we, we take every piece of feedback we get from our customers to heart and we're all about reinventing and continuously improving. So it sounds like you sit alongside your clients as opposed to play the, uh, not the adversarial role, that's not the right way of framing the agency-client relationship, but you, you're not it's keeping them at arm's length. Yeah, mm. it's a partnership for sure. I mean, if we don't care enough about you know their success, then the wholeheartedness that you need to actually take on the problem and solve it in a way that's, that's meaningful, it, it has to be there, right? So that comes through taking that partnership stance and really caring about their problems. John, as we bring this show down to a close now, I'm going to quote you one final time. In the conclusion of the design integration report, you said, and here's the quote, our research found that while 52% of designers feel they have a seat at the table, they have no voice. Hmm. Now, that's a, that's a bit sad. When I read that, I, there was almost a little tear in my eye. It made me feel like those designers were merely observing the change that's happening in their organizations rather than actively contributing to it. Now, without knowing every single design leader's situation, so generally speaking, what do you feel is important for design leaders to believe or perhaps to do to find their voices? I think it's a lot of what we've been talking about today. So really finding those meaningful connection points at the at like an organizational strategy level, right? So like, where's the company going? Where do we see our, our market heading? What are some of the, the innovations on the road ahead? And taking the conversation there. But I think at the same time, continuously trying to bring top of mind the value that the practice of human, human-centered design can bring to an organization, not just at making your products and services better, but also leading to new innovations, right? It's not just taking the seat at the table and saying, well, uh, my designers want to leave because, you know, they don't have enough, I don't know, whatever it is, the problem is that they're being hammered. Uh, there's no priorities. They're, they're being overloaded. You know, there's burnout. Those are all really valid conversations to be having and there's ways to solve them. But that's not the conversation that I think they've invited you to the table for. I think those are the problems they expect you'll, you'll be solving. So level up, I guess, and look at the potential partnerships that you're going to build at that leadership table, both upstream, downstream, horizontally, and maximize and amplify the value that design is going to bring to every one of those situations. Uh, look for those opportunities. And then if, if it's not clear, do your best to, I don't make it clear. If you have to become that evangelist in the voice, then play the role and be willing to step aside. If you, if you recognize that you're not doing that well, be willing to say, Hey, there is someone that should be here. I'm, I'm not the right fit. And that's, that's a really hard thing to say, but you need to recognize when you're, you might be doing a disservice. And if you feel too much, the imposter syndrome and the moments are too critical where what you say really does matter. You, you need to be honest both with yourself and, and, and the people who are expecting from you. Now, there's a fresh take. I can almost hear a pin drop 
and our listeners, <laughs> uh, wherever they're listening to this. I think it's a really important and refreshing refreshing note to finish on. So thank you, John. This has been a really great conversation. You've given me and I'm, I'm sure the people that are listening to this plenty of really challenging and practical things to think about and to help them to better articulate that value of design and move design integration forward in their organisations. So thank you for so generously sharing your stories and insights with me today. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. No, totally my pleasure, John. And John, if people want to connect with you and find out more about what you're doing, of course, you've got the new Limiter podcast out there. What's the best way for them to do that? Well, we've hosted a landing page for the podcast on our website at limina.co, but you know, I'm always posting on LinkedIn. So feel free to connect with me there. Open, open invitation to connect. Oh, great. Thanks, John. And to everyone who's tuned in, it's been great having you here as well. Everything that John and I have covered will be in the show notes, including where you can find John, the Limited Podcast, and all the other things that we've spoken about. They'll be fully chaptered. If you've enjoyed the show and you want to hear more great conversations like this with world-class leaders in UX research, product management, and design, don't forget to leave a review on the podcast or even just give it a rating. Subscribe, and it will turn up every two weeks. And also, there may be just one other person that you know that would get value from these conversations about design at depth, pass it along to them. If you want to reach out to me, you can find my profile on LinkedIn. Just type in Brendan Jarvis or there's a link at the bottom of the show notes, or you can head on over to my website, which is thespaceinbetween.co.nz. That's thespaceinbetween.co.nz. And until next time, keep being brave. <laughs>